Good morning. Welcome to the February 21st, uh, 2020 meeting of the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Citizens Oversight Committee. I'm John Windsor filling in for David Lane today. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order and start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Carol, could you call the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Lorraine Koss? Here. Charles Venuto? Here. John Luznar? Vinny Taranto? Here. John Windsor? Here. Terry Casto? Here. Uh, Laura Lee Thompson? Stephanie Ely? Courtney Barker? Here. Todd Swingle? Jay Moynihan? Here. Dennis Basile? Here. Um, David Lane and Melissa Martin have asked to be excused. And I expect um, a couple of latecomers. Okay. Uh, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, could I get a motion for approval of the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 How about approval of the minutes? Move to approve. Awesome. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. okay. Um, monthly progress and fiscal reports. Uh, Virginia Barker. Thank you. So I'm going to um, just touch on the things in the little one page progress report that aren't going to be covered in the bigger project line by line. So, um, as you know, the draft 2020 update to the Save Our Indian River Lagoon. Um, plan that was approved by you all or recommended by uh, this group unanimously. It was posted for the 15 day public review and it is scheduled to come up for the county commission uh, on Tuesday, the 25th, next Tuesday. Um, it's uh, agenda item J1. <coughs> um, derelict and vessels. That meeting starts at 9, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Okay. in the commission chambers. Derelict vessels, we removed four more this month, so we continue on our, you know, one a week rate. Um, video production, that contract has been executed, and we have three different projects that are ongoing that, um, that the video production company is, is working on filming, so we should have some new uh, material here soon. And um, the Beaches, leaky laterals. The comment there says the ordinance was tabled. Um, what has been happening is that uh, the utilities department has been working with the county attorney's office on ways to enforce any sort of uh, maintenance requirements for leaky laterals. And um, they've come up with three different alternatives that are going to be coming to the board in March, coming to the county commission in March. Um, so on the back side, uh, in terms of presentations and upcoming events, um, the, the straight talk event in January was very well attended. Um, what's not listed there is the uh, zoo in their efforts um, to gather community input for the aquarium. They had two uh, meetings recently um, and invited us to come in and talk <coughs> about progress with the half cent sales tax. So I did one afternoon and Brandon did the other afternoon. That was a, a good way for us to um, interact with folks who are interested in uh, wet things in our county. Um, Brandon is work, uh, going to be presenting at the next Florida Mat Master Naturalist Program um, in March. And Terry is going to be presenting at the Promise and Brevard Health Fair. Um, Last week, was that last week? <laughs> the Indian River Lagoon Symposium down at Harbor Branch. It was a, a two-day event this year instead of uh, a one-day event. And I, I heard that was very good. I, I was not able to attend. Um, and then uh, last meeting, the very last line on this, um, you all asked that we reach out to other entities who are doing things for the lagoon that aren't necessarily funded with the half cent sales tax. So I started out with the water management district and we're going to have a, a lineup of uh, different district projects that are going on um, in our community at your next meeting. So 
unless you have questions, we'll jump right into the financial report. No questions. Crystal. Crystal. Good morning. Morning. Um, as you can see, we have now collected 133 million, and we, um, per our financial sheet, we're at 2.3 million in expenditures. However, since creating this document, we have processed quite a few more invoices, and we're about 2.7 million. For this fiscal year. Yes, for this fiscal year. Any questions? Questions for Crystal? Anybody? I'll, I'll just clarify that at the bottom of the first page, the, the bottom line there before the totals is reserves, and it says, you know, 59 million. So there's been some misconception that there's $60 million floating around that's not being spent. As you all know, that's all allocated for projects. They're just multi-year projects where we don't expect those expenditures to happen this fiscal year. So we don't budget for them in this fiscal year. We budget them as reserves. Um, we have been working with the auditors and the budget office. We are going to come up with separate um, categories of specific capital restricted reserves. Typically, that has only been used for county capital projects. Um, we're unique in that we're funding we're entering partnerships, contract agreements with cities for them to construct capital projects. And so that didn't really fit the county's budgeting model. So we're working on a workaround for that. So all of those dollars will be shown as restricted for s specific projects. So people can tell where those dollars are meant to be going. Do you think it might be worthwhile to have a footnote at the bottom of the page with just a few words that say that the reserves are already committed or something like that? We can yeah. do that. Ju uh, ju just to avoid that confusion that might arise. Well, we'll be going through some changes um, within the budget due to the new request um, for from the auditors as well as from the budget office and the commissioners of how they want to see the budget presented okay. so that you can see where everything is allocated. So you'll, you'll see a little difference um, once we get to that point because there's a lot of work that goes on behind scenes. Before that I can post it, it has to be within the system correct but as well. for the next quarterly report, we can definitely add some verbiage sure. on this. Yes. Sure. Yes. It's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. I'm probably going to ask a question and you're going <coughs> to tell me that I should have been able to figure it out for myself. But I'm, so on the first page of this multi-page, or project status there's a bottom line budget 166794 as I read it all the projects that are listed then add up to something like 95 million is that is there something that I not uh, all right so each reserves yes the difference is the reserves yes well so there's 60 so what is that 155 so that's that's not 166 all right, if, if you look um, at the second box. Second box. That's where you're at, at the expenditure roll-up? Yes. All right, every single line is a line within the budget. So that all of those lines equal that 166 million. Right, right. Some to 166. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you have the um, comp and ben benefits, which are uh, the employees. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not questioning that. I'm trying to reconcile that with the last page of the project list that comes up. So that's oh, 95 yes, um, plus the, plus the, the uh, uncommitted futures, the 59. Is that the two numbers that should add up? You have the contingency, the reserves for cash forward, and then the reserves. So you have three lines at the very bottom before that $166 million. Mm -hmm. Over here on this, the three lines down here. Yeah. Yeah. So the seven, so the two, and the fifty-nine. Okay. I guess. I guess. I guess the difference. <clears throat> the budget total of ninety-five doesn't include comp operating expenses. Correct. Okay. Correct. Those are, right. are literally just the right, right. Op, um, the projects that are active at the moment. 
and what has been budgeted to them to be active at the moment, not including what's been put in reserves for those same projects. And where was the number that, that you had for cat, uh, where we, what, how much we've actually paid out at this point? All right, um, if you look at that same expenditure box on the very first page, okay. go all the way to the right at the bottom, you'll see that 2.3 okay, million. that's the actuals, okay. But that's only for this fiscal year. Yeah, that's year. for this fiscal year. That's not a cumulative. Oh, uh, okay. Yes, sir. Except you said it's actually more like 2.7 now. Yes. Um, what, are, what are the revenues that we've taken in so far just in this fiscal year? In this fiscal year, if you look up at the very top revenue box, mm -hmm. that second column uh, where it says total assigned right. YTD year to date. So it's about 7.8, I'm guessing. Um, the 20 is still to come. We have uh, 6.9 million that we have received. <coughs> okay, the interest earned and the refund is still to come. Interest earned, that's that's actively how much we have earned in interest. So far this year. So far this year. Oh, okay, so that's 7.3 and change. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get at. All right, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be sure. Thank you. Anybody else with questions for Crystal? Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> she complains that she doesn't usually get questions. So, yeah. Well, we can fix that. No problem. Yeah. So I'll set her up with Cherry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're on the performance table now with Terry? Yes. yes. Good morning. Uh, we went ahead and changed the performance table based off of the recommendations in the December meeting. So I'm going to start uh, by going over the table heading first. Um, we start with line item number. That's just one through, I think it's 102 or something. So we can follow each other a little better uh, as we're going through this table. The next um, column is the project number. You'll see some are uh, numbered like 2016, three, or, and so on. Those are from the original project plan. And then as we move forward, they have uh, consistent project numbers. The responsible entity, the project name, the project type. Then we have scope of work received, and that's just gonna be a complete or uh, in the works type of uh, uh, box there. Contract review status, if it's already executed, um, complete, it's out for signatures. Um, the percent it is in the design phase, the percent it is in the construction phase, and so 100% means that it, the construction's 100% complete. And then um, the last two columns we have requested Save Our Indian River Lagoon uh, funds, and then sent uh, Save Our Indian River Lagoon funds. So you'll see, um, page three and uh, two and three there's some that say leveraged funds this means that like the engineering and design work so far has been used with other sources of funding not um, SORL funding and then um, the ones that have uh, percentages represent SORL funding that's either been requested or expended already so that's the difference between those two columns so we also moved um, all of the complete projects to the top of the list. So you have to uh, flip over to page two, and um, you'll see where you start to see the pink represents um, projects that are in the works. And once it's, once it's um, complete, uh, it'll turn to green, and then the next phase will turn to pink. So that's um, so you can easily see what's going on there. So I'll go ahead and let um, Courtney start. She's going to do the stormwater projects for the county, and then just one okay. question. Go and ahead. The, again, the next to the last column to the right, requested save uh -huh. our Indian River lagoons. This is we when we approve one of these plans, we have a we have an estimate of what we're going to pay them, and mm -hmm. this is the percentage of that number that they have requested. Yes, the reimbursement mm -hmm. requests made what percentage of the total that we've agreed to pay them right. have they submitted invoices for reimbursement and they're coming in at like two percent and 0.62 well, percent some of these projects are have a rather large uh contracted budget so and and they're in the beginning phases 
But still, it's not, is it 2% like muck removal? But right. That, so those are the engineering, right? We're paying monthly invoices to the design engineers to permit what may be a 10 or $15 yeah. million dollar project. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not, the, the color scheme on this, um, I, I couldn't quite figure out what that was supposed to represent. Green, I guess, just simply means everything is 100%. Complete. Mm -hmm. And then this orangey pink color, salmon color, whatever you call it. In progress. Applies to those two columns. Yes. And then purple is for financials. And then when you get to the last page, yes. though, where you have a variety of colors yes. under scope of work received. Uh, These projects. Because of the year, or I, mean, I kind of lost track of what that was supposed to be. Yes, I was going to get to that. These projects are, um, we've received the scope of work. They are not necessarily contracted yet, so they might still be in the design phase. Um, so I highlighted them in different colors so you could see where they were in the plan originally. and. So you can have an idea of like if maybe there some of these on the list I know are in the works. Um, for instance, the which one was it? One of the zoo the coconut zoo. point eels yes, number project. eighty one. <coughs> line eighty one. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, line eighty one is about to be. Um, the contract's about to be executed for that one, and then I know uh, they've had a two-year permitting battle, which mm -hmm. they the permits just got issued. So, and then Melbourne let us know that um, the Roxy Avenue septic removal project's going to be uh, getting started soon as well. Okay, no, that that's fine. I just uh, I wasn't real clear if, if there was any significance beyond the fact that they were divided up by Seems year. Right. Any at one point it asked. Or, or we had talked about color coding this for the ones that were well, you know, slightly behind schedule, like maybe they're a year late versus, you know, we're three years into the plan, they still haven't given us. That's not the scheme that, we're using. Well, no, that is what yes. it is there. The red represents the 2017 18, orange or yellow means 2018 um, 19. Yeah. Red is printing out as pink, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, it's for the ADA. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, yeah, yellow and then uh, orange and blue. And so the blue represent projects that are upcoming in this next fiscal yeah, they're year. On, they're on track. Anything, mm -hmm. any color other than blue means they're, they've yeah. slipped in schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes, uh, we also added page numbers here. So if there's any other recommendations the committee would like to see or changes, we can uh, definitely discuss that. To, so we all get the information you want out of this table. I wouldn't mind saying on each one of these what the total estimated cost, cost is. Yeah. <coughs> Instead of a percentage? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, in, in addition, perhaps. In addition if to you the fit. percentage of the fits. You want to see the contract value? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea if yeah. South Street Basin Treatment Plant is $100,000 or right. $10 million. All in all, Terry, it's an excellent yeah, improvement. Oh yeah. Excellent improvement. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the project numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the second column, except for the ones that say 2016 something, yeah. all those other numbers are what they were when they came to the committee and you reviewed them and you said, you know, thumbs up for this one, thumbs down for that one. So yeah. we can go back and look at our right. Okay. Well done. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Just... <coughs> All right. So I'm going to do line 18 through 23. Um, for 18, denitric denitrification retrofit of John's Roads, we got the um, approval for the St. John's permits, and now we're waiting for Army Corps. I'm oh, sorry. And then for 19, Kingsmill Aurora, phase two of two, that's still in design. Um, 20, denitrification. Denitrification retrofit of Huntington Pond. That one, we're dealing with the landowner on that, and then design's done on that, and then we'll do permitting. Um, 21, retrofit of Flounder Creek Pond. Same with John's Roads. We got the uh, St. John's permit. We're waiting on Army Corps. <coughs> 
1349, we hit an issue um, with project location, so the consultant is currently going through and trying to determine a different location for that one. And then 1409, I finally reached out to Satellite Beach, and I'm dealing with them open communication with Public Works on what to do next for that project. So any questions? Yes. Dealing with a landowner, is that for an easement to access it or what? It's what a retrofit of a pond outfall, and the pond happens to be on this owner's property. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One other thing I forgot to mention, um, on some of the septic to sewer uh, pro projects, you asked for the number of homes connected, and I put that in parentheses under the project name, so if they're there, okay? And then I'm going to discuss the, um, some of the county, other county stormwater projects for lines 24 and 25. Um, these construction plans are 100% um, designed and uh, permits have been obtained. Um, these two projects, um, along with, uh, with 10 others, have been um, advertised for bid construction back in November and December. The bid results came in higher than expected, however the project has adequate funding to proceed. Um, the contract was um, awarded to Cathcart and we are expecting the contract to be executed within the next month. Um, for, let me scroll down. For lines 26 through 31, um, all of these projects are 50% complete. The bids have been received um, in the previous quarter and contracting and construction is expected to begin in um, later this quarter. Okay, no. any questions on those? Okay, are the, Excuse me, these are just ones where we're taking an existing baffle box and adding the BAM material? No, there's more this, to it than that? No, these are, these are new denitrification projects. So um, most of them, uh, well, some of them are ponds where we're adding uh, denitrification somehow in the exit from the pond mm -hmm. adding structures um, or their ditches where we're digging out the ditch deeper and shunting water down below the ditch into denitrification media and then it bubbles up cleaner on the other side or we're shunting it sideways onto different property which if there's room in the right of way that's great but often there isn't and so you know it requires land acquisition um, so we're, we're providing offline treatment and then back into the ditch. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be briefly going over lines 32 to 40, which essentially is the the county operated uh, muck removal projects and then I have one septic to sewer project that, that I'm project manager on. Um, are, are this, Virginia, are the cities going to come up and do? Okay, all right. Um, so we'll start off with Grand Canal. Um, as you all know, we did start construction mid-November. Um, the contractor was able to get a couple weeks of dredging in prior to the first required manatee shutdown. Um, they dredged about 5,700 cubic yards in terms of overall percentage it's pretty low you know that's just over one percent of the total quantity but the intent was to try and work any bugs out of the system so they were ready to hit the ground running when they could start dredging again in mid-march um, so they removed the 5700 cubic yards they were also able to dispose of it um, from the dmma site they hauled it out to the platts ranch for final uh, disposal um, they've got the site cleaned up. They're shut down right now. In the next week or so, they're going to start doing some, some <coughs> tidying up work at the DMMA site to get prepped for the, the March 16th startup date. Um, Sykes Creek muck dredging. Um, we recently put Sykes Creek Phase 1 out to bid. Um, we did receive bids last week. Um, I believe we received four bids. The low bidder was around $4.74 million. Um, that was about, I think it was about a million, million and a half below what our engineer's opinion probable cost was, so that's good. 
Um, we've still got a lot of upfront legwork to do in terms of you know evaluating pre-qualification documents from the contractor, ensuring that uh, county staff and the consultant are confident that they can do the project. So um, there's going to be a bit of administrative work leading up to this until we make a final decision and take it um, to the board for, for ultimate execution. Um, that project is overall project size for Sykes Creek is about 650,000 cubic yards. This is a small fraction of it. This is about 58,000 cubic yards. And all this material will be placed on the island adjacent to Kiwanis Island Park and it, it'll stay there permanently. Um, Merritt Island muck removal phase one. Um, we have received all the necessary, uh, necessary uh, regulatory authorization for the dredging com component of the project. We still will need to seek a permit modification for um, the upland processing of dredge material management area. Um, we had purchased the site adjacent to Walmart. There's a 10 acre site um, with SORL funding. Um, we are still working through negotiations on a proposal with the consultant to do the design and permitting for that site so we can ultimately use it as a, a temporary dredge material management area and potentially use it for um, stormwater treatment and, and other water treatment technologies as we, we see fit. So so that's a ways out. Um, we've, we've there's, that's going to be quite a bit of work to get that, get that work done and get that site permitted. Um, we're also looking into potentially utilizing that site for the phase two portion of, of the Sykes Creek project. So, so there's, there's going to be a sequencing of projects um, in all likelihood Merritt Island phase or the Merritt Island uh, dredging will not take place until Sykes Creek phase two is complete. Um, and then we get into uh, lines 35 and 36. It says Titusville West and Titusville East. That's actually Titusville Railroad West and Titusville Railroad East. Um, I just, just yesterday, I got the final deliverables from the consultant who we had tasked with going out and collecting the bathymetric data and characterizing the, the muck volumes, the muck thickness in those two, those two borrow areas. So, um, so the next step is moving forward with permit level design and preparation of a permit application package for both the Army Corps and the FDEP for, for final permitting for, for that area. Um, the same goes for NASA, NASA Causeway East. We did the exact same thing. The, that particular consultant was working both on Titusville East and West, or Titusville Railroad <coughs> East and West, and NASA Causeway East at the same time. So I got all three of those deliverables, if you will, at the same time. Um, O'Galley Northeast muck dredging, um, we have, so, so it's an interesting situation. Um, previously, the, the re previously, the ranking had shown that O'Galley Northwest ranked better. Um, there, was, there was a Scrivener's error, if you will, um, in terms of the labeling between O'Galley Northwest and O'Galley Northeast. Turns out O'Galley Northeast has, has a higher ranking in terms of cost per pound of nitrogen removed. Um, we are very close to having the contract documents finalized and ready to go out to bid for O'Galley Northwest. But, but with this change, we um, need to have a consultation with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, their civil group, really. It's not so much a regulatory portion, even though a small fraction of it is, um, because we will need, our pipeline corridor will have to cross the, uh, the ICW right away. So we will need. The, the, the engineering component, um, you know, their engineers would have to sign off on this temporary pipeline corridor because they have uh, a, a minimum navigation depth and, you know, the pipeline will have to sit at some distance below that depth to ensure, you know, there's no potential for collisions with crossing vessels. So um, we're working through that with the consultant right now. Um, Brevard County, uh, let's see, Rockledge muck dredging. Um, we have a proposal um, coming from uh, a, another consultant who's going to be doing the initial field investigation, which includes um, surveys, submerged aquatic vegetation surveys, natural resource surveys, as well as um, uh, some muck thickness mapping so we can, we can refine the quantity of material that we'll have in that particular uh, in that particular area. So I expect to have that in the next couple weeks or so. And I, 
I, I don't know what the schedule on the completion of that data collection will be yet because I haven't seen the proposal from the consultant. Um, and finally, the MICO sewer line, slowly but surely we are plugging along with that. Um, we did get the, um, the right of way permit from the FDOT for the portion of the, the force main that will be running parallel to US-1 within DOT's right of way. Um, we are currently working through finalizing some requests from the Brevard County Public Works right of way department, a uh, right of way permit for um, the portion of the, the line that will be running along Mico Road, which is a county road. Um, and we are working through the negotiations. Well, uh, the county is working through the negotiations with the property owner to obtain um, the property for the, the, the placement of the list, lift station. So that's where we're at. We're really close. The design is probably 95%, but until we have all of these you know, components in place, we're, we're not ready to put this project out to construction. Um, with that, does anyone have any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. I'll be going over lines 41 through 45. So the um, first one, Sykes Creek Zone In. So the design is 100% uh, and we um, will be going to bid. The bid will be advertised um, the 27th of this month. Um, we expect to have a contractor selected in April for that. So uh, making good progress there. On lines 42 and 43, Sykes Creek Zone M and Zone T, we um, are Still at the 30% um, design, we have um, an issue with utilities, as we discussed <coughs> last month. Um, the existing FPNL um, utilities uh, make it very difficult to put gravity in the same area. Um, so um, that was last month, and over the, um, in this next month, we will be uh, further discussing other options we have available to us, such as vacuum sewer or um, you know, moving power poles out of the way. Um, and in South Central Zone C, um, we have uh, submitted um, our permitting um, to the right of way, and um, we uh, have started a, a land acquisition, um, which will be just obtaining the easements that the HOAs um, agreed to at the start of the um, project. And then for the Sally Beach Pilot um, sewer lateral replacement, um, we have 21 um, repairs complete. Um, five reimbursements um, in the pipeline to be paid out um, any day now. Right, any questions? Yeah, so what's the state of the uh, septic tanks that are removed? You know, where do they end up? So they will be um, abandoned. Uh, that's where they uh, punch out the top and the bottom, fill it with sand so that it doesn't, isn't a future hazard. Mm -hmm. um, and then the pipes that are flowing um, from the house into the septic system will just be rediverted to the street. Okay, so they're abandoned in place. Abandoned in place. And a uh, homeowner, if they wanted to go another route, um, there are other routes, but typically abandoned in place by punching out the top and the bottom. Uh, on, on the sewer lateral replacements, is that a, a transaction directly between the contractor and the homeowner? Or does it right. go through the city? or? No, so that is... Um, an agreement where they um, contract with their plumber of choice and ask for reimbursement okay. um, from us. Okay. Yeah. Question over here. Is, is there a way that we can, since the, you know, on the beach side we have so much sewer lining projects done and then the laterals, you know, is there a way that, if, like, is the county utilities department looking at? the I and I decrease. I'm just wondering if we could get a report on that, like the difference between before they did these big projects, maintenance projects, to see if that's assisting in the reduction of the I and I. Yeah, um, we'll probably see further I and I um, and decreases in near term because um, the methodology for their lining has changed okay. from um, what they expect to be the worst pipes and lining those to an actual um, assessment, assessment mm -hmm. and lining the worst of the worst first. Okay. So um, that is in action now. So okay. we should be seeing. So we should be able to hear from that yeah. about that soon. Okay. And, 
Anthony and Zone C, you mentioned an HOA. Do, do you know the name of that HOA offhand? Indian River Isles. There's a North Central and South HOA. They're each separate. Thanks, Anthony. Just a quick comment. That's in my, my quick math here, that's more than 400 connections. I think 439 connections you described there. Well mm -hmm. done. Yep. And uh, one other question. So the plumber of choice, so do we have like a recommended list or are plumbers, are they an easy supply? Um, so far, none of the homeowners have complained of not being able to find a plumber. Okay. Um, we cannot recommend plumbers. Um, so it's, there's been a wide variety of plumbers that have done the work so far. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Just the last thing I know, Virginia, where obviously the, the county is doing the county work, but there's so many parts of the county. When we hook these up or when we are anticipating hooking up these many people to the, to the sewer system, are we then letting uh, Brevard County Sewer know that this number of people are being added? Or are they aware so that they're certain that their capacity is not all of a sudden going to be an yeah. issue? So their engineers are um, approving these designs okay. and their permitting staff um, are well aware. So. Right now, um, these projects will be um, connecting to the South Central plant <coughs> and the Sykes Creek plant, which are both at around half capacity. Yeah, those are those have good ones. Okay, yeah. thank you. But yeah, we're we're looking at the capacity on all of these projects, and um, some of them, this is an expansion of the service area, and that has to come to the county commission. So there's there's a lot of process okay, behind. On. Yes. Okay. That's why these are the first. <laughs> we're good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I'll be going over 46 through 48, the <coughs> education and outreach. So the fertilizer public education and the septic public education are uh, sort of going simultaneously through the Lagoon Loyal program. So we just renewed their contract for the second year. They've finished the focus groups on the program and we'll be meeting with them in the next two weeks to go over how they'll be implementing the feedback from those focus <coughs> groups to improve the Lagoon Loyal program and we're working with editing out some of the uh, new s parts of the site that we'll be rolling out. And the grass clippings campaign, that's one we're doing with Marine Resources Council. They are currently in talks with their consultant for the new work that will be going out after their you know, previous surveys and things were done. So once they finish working out the contract with the consultant, then we'll be moving forward with them on that. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to uh, do lines uh, 49 through 51, or, well, 52, sorry, 52. Uh, so line 49, we are 75% uh, through on the design, and uh, we've been working in close concert with the uh, homeowners and beautification committee there in uh, for that project so we're very close to having that design completed we hope um, for number 50 the North Indian River Lagoon oysters we are six percent into our construction and material acquisition and for the uh, North Indian River Lagoon plants we have completed the design for that project and uh, it's a relatively small one so um, probably it'll all kind of come through in a balloon at the end when it's completed. And for the last will be uh, our Central Indian River Lagoon Oyster Project is 100% um, designed and 32% uh, into our uh, material acquisition and preparation. Thank you. Thanks. I have a, just a general okay. question. Yep. Um, who does, when you, when you start construction, who does that project plan? Uh, for the, these are all uh, Brevard Zoo projects, so they are doing the majority of the um, So they lay out like Microsoft Project or a PERT plan or something. I mean, we've seen, you've seen the yes, evidence they do, of Yes, they, they do use. submit, uh, for the, they do design drawings for the Living Shoreline projects, and, and okay. per, they have to do the design for all the permitting for all the Oyster projects so as well. So in general, all of these different projects, where the, your staff is not on the hook to do these plans? Correct. Okay. And is there consistency across the different plans as to how you're measuring? How, you, how did you come up with 6% on whichever one of these? Is that 
cost incurred to date or is it they report to us how far along they believe they are with their uh, breakdown of permitting uh, material acquisition, preparation, staging, and installation. And so we take those percentages that they give us and, and weigh them out for a, to, to show progress. So so progress. There's a reporting form that's attached to their contract, and they identify specific milestones and percent complete for each of those milestones, and then we take the average okay, of so that to come up with. So it's, it's not consistent. just looking at the cost that they've expended. Yeah. Correct. Okay, Correct. good. Thank you. Yes. When you talk about material acquisition, mm -hmm. is the zoo relying on the oyster gardeners or is there another? So, I mean, what, what does that consist of? So for the oyster projects, um, that's a, a lot of it's buying bag material, um, Using the, sh the, the shells, the shells shell. and, and, and getting all of that prepared. Uh, I think it also plays into their uh, outreach that they do when they, they have uh, <coughs> volunteer groups that will build habitats or that will build bags or And um, by, I would imagine that they're putting spat in with the When it comes to an oyster well. project, uh, yeah. when it comes to construction and we're ready to deploy a project, mm -hmm. uh, if we've decided that, that seeding that site is necessary, then that's where we start with the oysters that have been gardened and then and go from there depending on the need. Garden or spat. But this material acquisition is largely the shell mm -hmm. and, you know, the bag material and whatever. And then in getting all of that shell in bags mm -hmm. ready to go. To actually be deployed. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's got a cure for 90 days and they've got to collect it from restaurants. And okay. Thank you. Question? Thank you. I'm going to touch on some of the city projects, and then uh, Danny from Melbourne is going to come up to talk about her projects. Um, so <coughs> I'm going to start with the Cocoa Beach uh, Water Reclamation Facility on Line 53. Um, this work is approximately 25% complete. Um, this quarter, they primarily worked on filter number one. They took it out of service, um, demoed it, and then they installed a baffle wall with an aqua diamond filter and now they're putting it all back together. All of the electrical conduit work has, underground has been complete, and now it's just the above ground conduit work that needs to be complete on that phase. Um, Cocoa Beach muck dredging, phase 2B. Um, the pre-construction meeting was held um, in November. On-site activity began um, with setting up the DMMA and um, their restoration efforts. The project is approximately 4% complete at this time, and um, they uh, began dredging on February 1st for that project. Um, phase 3, Cocoa Beach Muck Dredging Phase 3 is complete, and they recently submitted for their final reimbursement of the 20, remaining 25%. Uh, the, I'm going to move on to muck removal of the Indian Harbor Beach Canals. This is about 80% um, um, design phase complete, and they are in the process of prepping their permit application package. Um, the Big Muddy uh, Baffle Box in Indian Harbor Beach, um, this design and permitting is about 90% complete. Um, they just applied for a permit with St. John's, and um, they're waiting to hear back from Brevard County whether a sanitary sewer force main um, that's in conflict with the project is actually active or abandoned. So they're waiting to hear back on that. Um, and it's anticipated to go to bid in March um, with construction complete by the end of August. Um, Brandon already touched on the MRC uh, grass clippings campaign, so I'll go ahead and scope move on to Melbourne. And Danny wants to present on that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Danny with the City of Melbourne Engineering Department, and I apologize for having to be on television as much as I have been the last couple of days. <laughs> but I'm going to lose your table there for a second so I can show you a few pictures while I do my button. So <clears throat> you can watch and listen. So um, we have four subject to sewer projects right now that are currently. Um, in various stages of completion and connections. We're working with our PIO office and a few other of our staff to um, 
do a little better outreach to our property owners so we can get them connected. We're working on a project to help help them help them get their funding in place so that they can go ahead and start um, being able to pay for these septic to sewer conversions um, and figure out how we're going to be able to reimburse them the most efficient way so they're spending the least amount of dollars up front. Um, our um, wastewater treatment plant project is about 60% right now in design plans and they're working on permits and we hope to see a little bit more um, in the next quarter. Um, our Riverside Shoreline project is um, in a slow holding pattern right now. We're working with uh, the St. John's on our permits for the foresters. Um, we have three baffle boxes right now, Apollo, GA, Cherry Street, and Grant, and they're all in various stages of design. And Thrush will be going out to bid um, in the next uh, few weeks. We're hoping to have that out to bid in the next 45 days, but uh, at the moment we're still waiting on our final permit. And this one is the <laughs> Cliff Creek box. So we um, opened our bids, went to construction in the last quarter, and on Wednesday, we put a very big piece of concrete in mm -hmm. the ground. So the box is 20 feet wide by 25 feet long. It's about 14 and a half feet deep. Um, and we had a great day finally getting concrete to swing. So. <laughs> Got some PR. Is that my PR? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, these are just some pictures that we took while we we're out there. And I think there's a video of the box swing. Those are fun pictures. So the box came in parts. It did. So nice. the box is six base pieces. Um, and then the top and riser section is another four. So the actually the big weight lift um, will actually be on um, Tuesday um, when they put the tops in. So there's a, a riser wall and then the top that goes on top. Um, they are out there right now as we speak um, trying to get um, the internals, sorry, <coughs> all the internals in place. Um, this box is so large that with the inflow that they came in, so we have dual sets of, in, of internals. So there's two big baskets, there's two big, there's double sets of weir walls, and then there's um, the bold and gold um, boom on the back end of this thing. So they're out there right now trying to get them all set. And what'd you say the dimensions are? So it's an internal dimension of about 20 feet wide, 25 feet long, and about 15 feet deep. So. Um, basin's 515 acres, so it's a fairly substantial size basin. Um, this is the largest ba baffle box um, in our um, set of baffle boxes connected to the largest basin. Um, so we're looking at trying to find those final outfall locations so that we can put them right before they get to the lagoon and this happens to be just around the corner. Are you seeing any challenges budget-wise uh, so we're seeing all sorts of prices all over the place. Um, we anticipated this one because of the size of the box and what was going on. We we had a, a we worked really well with the vendor of the box to try to narrow down those costs early on. Um, so we were pretty comfortable with our budget. On some of our other projects, we're seeing we're seeing some variation in concrete numbers now. The close the more work that's being done in the Orlando area with the I four and the lack of concrete availability is causing some problems, not so much on the boxes, but on some of the, the RCP. You can't get concrete pipe in Brevard County. You have to get, has to come from somewhere else. And we had some issues with some of the piping on this project. Um, and then we um, worked through those issues on it. Um, our box culverts are also coming from the same company that the baffle box is from, so we're comfortable with those. But we're, we're seeing variations in construction costs um, much different than we did three or four years ago. Anybody else? Anybody else? Good stuff. Thank you. All right. Now we are going to um, start back on line 66 for the Myra project. This, um, we have eight of 63 properties connected. I think there's a typo on that one. Um, <coughs> Should, it said nine, it should be eight. Um, for the Palm Bay North Region Water Reclamation Facility, construction is out to bid and um, wait, awaiting council approval and execution of the contract, and they are expecting the notice to proceed um, by March. 
the St. John's project for the Crane Creek is 90% um, complete for design and the um, Army Corps of Engineer and DEP permits have been submitted. Um, the Coleman Ponds project for Titusville is complete and the final invoice was submitted um, just recently. Uh, the South Street, La Paloma, and St. Teresa projects um, are all complete and the final invoices were also su recently submitted. The Titusville High School baffle box um, is at 66% design and 15% um, complete overall. The Titusville Osprey Wastewater Treatment Facility project is um, reached 45% in the design phase. Um, the sewer lateral project um, is still in design at 9%. And we, uh, this quarter, executed the Titusville Zones A to G septic removal. Um, and then the West Melbourne Sylvan Estates project as the design is 100% complete, bidding is complete. Um, the notice to proceed for construction was issued in October, and the final completion is scheduled for November of this year. And then it goes into the projects that are upcoming or past in some cases. So, and then if, um, the back page is a. Um, a little table with the previous scopes of work that have been received, the quarter, uh, previous quarter contracts that were prepared, um, executed, um, projects that are in design and construction. And so there's a comparison. This is different from what was in the previous uh, performance table. So I adjusted the numbers because before you remember we had um, a lot of the county projects were construction and engineering. And so they were kind of double counted in that sense. So I streamlined everything so that there was no double counting. And it's now more per project and not where the, if the county has a contract for a different design engineer or anything like that. You show that as a column instead of a separate column. Right, right. Are there any questions or, and suggestions for the performance table and how we should change it or something else you would like to see? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, a lot of, we have a number of projects in Titusville. What kind of education is being done around those? Is the city involved in any of that? or? Um, we have a publication that goes out um, monthly uh, in print. They print thousands of them. And then it's also emailed all over the place called Titusville Talking Points. Mm -hmm. And they have been really They've done a really, really good job every month of talking about the different um, stormwater projects and stuff. I mean, they, one whole issue was dedicated to the different stormwater projects that they've doing. So our, our city administration and staff is extremely proud of the work that they've been doing mm -hmm. up there, and they've done a really good job of um, trying to educate people. Mm -hmm. And we also worked with the city of Titusville and their communications people to put an insert in the utility bills that they'll be getting this month just to give the general update on the plan progress as well. So. Okay. So you asked for feedback and we mentioned earlier the, the goodness of having just a, a, a sort of a round number cost um, with each of these. I don't want to take us into an earned value uh, dissertation but <clears throat> there's a couple here that um, would sort of look like red flags, right? That when you have a project comes in saying they're four percent complete and they're billing actuals that they're saying are like five or six percent, says something about you know you're spending more money than you should have had allocated. I'm not saying that that's a real issue, just that that's kind of a red flag to say, hey, we ought to look at that. All the rest of them hmm. look like they're in. I think road. part of that is the design. The design is a major portion of these. That yeah. a lot of background work that people don't see. So that's where that 4% or any of the percentages could come from if it's <coughs> they've asked for reimbursement in, um, in the design phase. But the, the reimbursement is against actuals, right? 
Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the one of the issues with project management is always trying to, you know, you get to the 95% point and then you can't claim credit for the milestone. You're still spending the money, but you got that little yeah. 5%. And some of them have a substantial mobilization cost <laughs> relative to the rest of the construction. Mobilization cost. Is. Yeah, I mean, especially with dredging, right. you know, you can have a million, million and a half mobilization cost. Before you actually start moving mud. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. Good job. Thank okay. you. Anybody uh, else? I d well, just one more question, but I think maybe more for Virginia. On the, on the septic removal projects, the connections, did we, I know at one point, if uh, my memory serves me right, we were looking at ways that it could potentially we could fund it directly rather than the homeowner having to finance have we made any progress on that so <laughs> anthony's like no <laughs> we're we're we we need to work out a tri-party contractual arrangement and um so that's and and then we have to do a whole rfp around that but until we figure out how that contractual arrangement would work do we is that in the future or yes is it too yes. difficult <laughs> yes it's okay. a priority amongst okay. many priorities okay to quickly summarize I think that the group was very pleased with the uh, performance project table and there was only one recommendation for something being added and that was about the total project cost Okay, thank you, Terry. Good job. John, I did, I did have just two questions. I'm sorry. Two, two questions. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> nice uh, try, John. Now, be, caref <laughs> be careful. Uh, there, You're gonna, skating on thin ice, buddy. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. And I'm not a good skater, so this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible. I'm game um, when it comes the, to the Two things, um, I, I know, and this would maybe be for us to talk about or to, to look at, and maybe at a later date, but with all the, the projects, there are some that are fiscal year 27, 2018, and I know a lot of these projects are, um, they're, they're complicated, and, and I don't, so I don't know at what point we look at these projects and say maybe, you know, we'd like to see why they aren't going, or maybe, you know, maybe it's, there's a better way for the money to be spent, and I, I don't know at what point that is, but that may be something where we come at, um, and we as a, a, as a committee may want to discuss um, down the road. I'm not saying we do it now because I'm already on thin ice. And then the, the, <laughs> the, the, the second thing was uh, um, an idea hit me, and I know we're talking about increased construction costs and maybe material costs. And I didn't know if the money that we have, if there would be a way to, to do some of that in advance because I think the farther we get away from the date at which we created our budget and created our numbers, the larger that that is going to grow. So if there's a way, and I'm not saying again that we do it now, but down the road, if there's a way to look at some of these projects and say, well, if we can buy this material now, um, maybe that will save us that, that increase um, down the road. Or at least we'll have it purchased, which will help us better budget what our final expenses are going to be. So. That'll have an effect on the interest. $404,000 this year in and, interest only. And I do think that there's there's kind of a trade-off there because what if the economy goes down and then the construction marking crashes cheaper, and stuff's yeah. cheaper? So th there is kind of give and take, but it was just an idea to, to look at and to see where we're going. So, Would, you like, chair, I'm sorry, I, would you like to suggest that as a future agenda item rather than bringing it up? I mean, you've, you've brought this up a couple of times before sort of in random comments. <laughs> And perhaps, perhaps what we should do is, if you feel strongly about it, maybe we should have a, 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 an agenda item on it and have a discussion on it mm -hmm. and then have some sort of vote on it. Uh, I think sometimes staff gets mixed messages from the committee. We have these conversations here. We never come to any conclusion about them. And then they're left with, well, what did they say? Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to make it clear what we're saying. I and so I, I would suggest that if it's necessary, are you suggesting it's necessary to have this conversation? And should we have an agenda item on it? How, how does, I would say I think it's a good idea to have a discussion on it, which would be an agenda item. So yes. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. I, I mean, I think yeah. Three, when it's three years in arrears, I think not only is the the variance, but it's just okay. like what's going okay. on. Okay. And so that was a, a motion and a second. Oh, you can't make a motion. Right? I, I can. A second. He, I can oh, make a motion. Can. Can. Guys, John, guys, yeah, I can. Leave the room but, and I can second. But you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll second that. Would somebody I else will. like to second Vinny's? I, 
I'll second. Okay, so motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that'll be an agenda item for a future meeting. Thank you. All right, now we're done with that. And we're gonna move on to special presentations, but before we do, let me remind anybody in the audience who wants to make public comments, please fill out a public comment card, and we'll have that later in the meeting. Okay. So, special visitors. Virginia, would you like to introduce the first one? Um, Drew Palmer from okay. <laughs> Florida Institute of Technology, and I cannot begin to tell you what the title of his talk is. Microbial Populations in Indian River Lagoon Muck. Uh, oh, uh, sure. Here we go. <laughs> It, it changed a little bit over uh, the evening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to come speak today. Uh, I'm going to give you sort of an update on our project, uh, looking at the <coughs> microbial uh, loads that we're finding in the legacy muck loads in Sykes Creek. Um, and so just as a reminder of what the project goal is, uh, basically we're looking at the extent of human sourced um, biological and chemical um, contaminants present in muck. Um, the motivation for this is to better understand what's in the muck for informing sort of removal, storage, and disposal. And um, if we can try and figure out what pollution sources have sort of legacy impacts on muck composition. Um, so simplifying basically how much of, a, of an issue is it to handle muck. <laughs> And I apologize if this seems sort of classroomy. I can't. I can't get the teacher out of me. <laughs> um, so this is based on a project that we did in collaboration with Orca. Um, we did sampled 100 sites on Sykes Creek. Um, we've uh, for our subset of the work, we've selected 30 sites based on a toxicity assay they have, which is a microbial-based thing. Basically, they incubate with the muck, and if the bacteria die then we cite that as, well, the extent to which they die, um, shown here either in high or low. Red to green is basically an indicator of, of how toxic that site is potentially. And those are what we're using as a way of a kind of just paring down the sites that we're gonna look at. And so you have a couple here shown in this Google map image um, where we're kind of getting diversity both in location and in toxicity. So we've got 10 sites that are highly toxic, 10 sites that are medium toxicity, and 10 sites that are low toxicity. So what was the blue color? Extremely low? Yes. So it looks like, I'm sorry, it looks like the, um, it looks like where the living shoreline is over towards the, the natural shoreline, you have blue. It's, that's a pretty, uh, pretty good indicator of yeah. a natural so the, shoreline, the, one how, of the, how a natural shoreline helps. Yeah, one of the previous ones, uh, talks I gave was on the emerging organic contaminants, so that's the organic side of this, um, and we did find that there is substantially lower, in general, substantially lower um, uh, organic contaminants on that, can I do that? Yeah, on the side of the lagoon. C can I make a suggestion we let Drew go ahead and finish his yeah, presentation? Yeah, I'm sorry. And <laughs> I just get so discussions excited. After. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I will, Look, since we are stopped, I will working. say that that's not 100%. Um, because there were some sites, you know, there were a couple of sites in there that spiked really high in some areas that were not high in urban development. Um, it was actually kind of a point of interest for us. And um, I have a student who's trying to figure out, um, is there some particular reason why that spot would be high? All right. Um, so uh, phase two, we've moved on from organic contaminants and now we're starting to look at microbial species. Um, this is a subset of the group that we're looking at. Um, basically, this list has been selected because it's got anthropogenic human source microbes, um, potentially antibiotic resistant bacteria like Staph aureus or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. These are um, important uh, infections um, for immunocompromised patients. Um, environmentally sourced um, human pathogens and then um, some species that are related to harmful algae blooms, which I would just, on the onset, my assumption is those are essentially kind of almost like control organisms for us. We expect to find them in the lagoon sediment. It'd be weird if we didn't find them there. I'd be concerned that there was something wrong with the assays that we were using if we didn't find any of um, these kind of organisms. So the challenge that we have is that there's a, a broad um, species distribution. Um, and so one of the classical ways you would do this is you'd culture them, grow a bunch of them up to high concentrations and start doing some studies. Um, but because it's so varied in the types of organisms we're looking at, some are bacteria, some are algae, um, that kind of method won't really work. Um, so we needed a, a universal method for detection. Um, and obviously there's a, a price point that, that, has, that we have to meet to satisfy this. 
So um, we basically picked something that they all have, which is uh, DNA, right? The program that tells them uh, what they are. Um, and so we can isolate um, DNA from the muck samples directly. Um, we can amplify that by a method um, that's called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. Um, if you like CSI shows, whenever you see those people <laughs> holding up little tubes and doing this, that's PCR. Um, and so this is a common uh, technique used in environmental science. Um, basically to monitor what kind of species you have in a sample. Um, here I've color coded um, and I, I do not want the color to uh, have any sense of alarm. Red means that we have we, we got a signature for presence and the blue means that we have an absence of that signature. Um, that doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that just because it's there that that is dangerous. It's just a statement that we found it, right? Um, so this um, basically was built in tandem with the original um, organic contaminants of the phase one study. So up here you can see the phase one uh, profile. So we took our sample of muck from each of our 30 sites. We went this route and that's how we isolate our organic contaminants. Um, it's faded out because I don't want to go over it. Um, and then this direction we did the DNA isolation, the polymerase chain reaction. Um, this was a fairly straightforward optimization process. Um, I have to admit this was um, much more difficult. It turns out getting uh, genetic material out of muck is, is um, very challenging. Um, so uh, what we actually had to do was we found that the muck has met metals, um, decaying matter that we call humic acids um, that have a tendency to interfere with your ability to isolate the genetic material. So we spent uh, a couple of months trying to going basically back and forth between different kits and different methods and actually uh, working with some of the companies to develop a, a good process for getting this out. And so now we have a method where we're extracting those. And so um, I'm going to show you some uh, just Again, there's that list. Um, what we've picked is specific genes. This I obviously doesn't mean a lot to most people, but these are specific genes for each of these organisms that we're using as a reference. Basically, we've we've uh, you can think of it almost like a barcode. That if that barcode shows up in our sample, then that means that that organism has a high probability of being there. What we cannot tell you is whether it is alive or dead. So those organisms could die in the muck and they would leave that genetic ma material there. It's just a signature that it was there at some point, whether it was recent. Um, now, we only sampled the surface of the muck, so the, the time frame of that is probably pretty, pretty short-lived. But we cannot tell you whether it's alive or dead. We just know that it was in the muck at some point. And concentration? We do not have concentration, right? This is just presence or absence at this point. Right. Um, so this is sort of a sample of a kind of a picture of the, the type of um, diagnostic that our, our sample works under. So each of these wells will get um, a sample from one site for one organism. We do each test for each organism in triplicate at, for each site. So basically we're looking at every site for every organism three times. This is just sort of a standard to cover our bases. Um, and again, if we have, if I'm, what I'm about to show you is a table. If it's red, that means we found a signature for it. If it's in blue, we did not find a signature for it yet. Um, we have moved through about 20 of the sites. Um, we have 10 more sites to go, and then we're also doing some follow-up work looking at the water column. So as a quick glance here, um, this is just showing you some, some reds and some blues. Um, again, if we look down at something like uh, K. brevis, which is involved in harmful algal blooms, we did find a signature for it, which is, again, what we'd expect to see. Um, coliforms, which are um, like E. coli, um, these are naturally occurring sort of fecal-associated bacteria. I would expect to find those as well. Um, some of these uh, Vibrio organisms, these are associated with um, uh, diarrhea and certain other unpleasant diseases. Um, Staph aureus and Pseudomonas, again, we found those. Um, those are very common occurring natural organisms. So the, the presence of them, again, is not necessarily any, any cause for alarm. But you can see there is a distribution. Um, we didn't find every, we didn't hit positive for everything. Um, we still, like I said, have 10 more sites to look at, and then we're going to be um, mapping these to their actual locations where they occur. So at this point, we do not have the sites specifically where we found them at. So we're doing these this works separately and then we're going to reference back to the tables because we don't want to be biased in uh, where we're looking at, right? We don't want to assume, well, because we had a high toxicity in the emerging organic contaminants were high in this spot, I don't want to immediately be correlating to an organism and saying, well, it also is high in Vibrio. I want to keep that unbiased for now.
-hmm. Right. So one thing we can say at this point is that muck does collect a variety of human and environmentally sourced microorganisms, um, and and so that that is not really unexpected at all. Um, that that is exactly what we'd expect to find. The fact that we do see K. brevis there and a couple of other these diagnostic sort of environmental organisms is a good sign. Um, it actually means that we are seeing what we 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 believe we have a very solid assay here. Um, we're continuing to map to our sites, and then um, we do have other organisms that we'll be adding uh, to that list as well. And I'm happy to take any questions you guys have. You, you listed whether they were present or absent, but in how many of the samples were they present? Absent. That's uh, we're so I'm putting that information together. Okay. So in some of I mean in some of them it's only one. So just right. in the emerging like um, with the emerging organic contaminant studies we had some where it hits positive in one spot, um, and so part of that would have to do with the amount of the the, the we're able to isolate out uh, from the muck, right? And again I mean just because I do not find it it does not mean it was it was it's never been there. It's just within the sample that we see we do not see it. Right. But uh, coliforms, I, think, are, I will say, hit pretty commonly. Right. I mean, I do think it's, it's good that we don't have Shigella or Salmonella or cholera. Yeah. You know, that's um, a good, those are good. That's I, good. I will <laughs> say that, um, so from, from personal experience, we, we have been trying as a, in an aside in our own personal interest to culture uh, microbes out of the muck. And um, it's, it's actually pretty bad for a lot of bacteria. So, um, I mean, it's very highly anaerobic. So a lot of the aerobic species don't, uh, you know, oxygen requiring species just don't make it in there for very long. Dr. Parry, kind of a methodology question. This is pretty new. Do you have any reference standards to kind of verify quality control on your Work. Yeah, so we've done a little bit of um, spiking the muck with actual um, microorganisms, other microorganisms we work on in the lab, and spiking and seeing how much DNA we can get out so we can control for the amount of DNA that we're getting. Um, and then some of those are reference organisms in here, like um, we use E. coli, which is, a, is a, essentially a coliform, and we can use that as a marker to make sure that, our, that we're pulling the right stuff out. So it seems like then what you're finding too is that the, the bacteria, especially the uh, anaerobic ones, that all the more reason to get rid of the muck, is what I'm hearing. Yes. I mean, I think it's, it's, the, it's kind of the same as with the emerging organic contaminants. These things are going to persist there. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, anytime, if we don't remove it, when storms come through, it'll get churned up and back out into the water column. And, and so the, the ones that, are, uh, that need oxygen are not going to survive there because this is an anaerobic environment. But once we take it out and spread it on the ground, that's an aerobic environment. So the ones that could survive in anaerobic conditions are not going to survive where we're taking them. Yeah. So, so this is not, I, I'm, I'm worried about the use of the word toxicity, and we've had a, a mm -hmm. lot of alarm about that. And, and back with the ORCA study as well, the, the work that they did. Um, with relative toxicity, you know, a lot of that we believe was hydrogen sulfide, which is a completely naturally occurring thing. So I just I wanted to provide yeah. some context. Yeah, if you want absolutely. To so I mean, I, build I would, on that. I, I would say that you know that that definitely my my experience with this is that aerobic organisms are not going to survive in that deeper layer of, of muck. And then again, when you when you spread it out, those anaerobic organisms are gonna die. Um, and so it, I think removing the muck is a much better is a much better idea. Right, so I really think the story here is that, you know, we focus on the charismatic organisms and the fish, but it really starts at the microbial level. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have good microbes, like we have to have in our digestive system, it's the same with the lagoon. They're not gonna, it's, we're not gonna get to those species that most people are aware of. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to come back full circle. On you. So what, what was the mechanism? Here you, drove, you drilled down to get individual components. What, what, what drove the original, the, the, the first map that we saw of the toxic, toxic, toxicity? The toxicity. So this is a simple assay that, that Orca uses. Um, basically, it's a, a co-treatment of you take like a little culture of microbes that you grow up and then you expose them to, the, to a sample of the muck um, and basically use the same amount of muck in each sample. Yeah. You treat the bacteria and then in basically the bacteria release um, a marker that you can measure and if they're alive. And if they're dead, they don't release that marker. And they measure that and they say, okay, well, X number of 
bacteria died and so that is more toxic but the, okay. the term is yeah. just that it's it's a relative toxicity and it, it just means that there's something in the muck and and that relationship it's it's a i mean it's a it's just a a, a quick way of kind of picking where you might look for interest because the fact that you have that muck, it's in a rather high concentration relative to the microbe. So you're probably in, enhancing that effect, right? And so, as I said before, when we did the EOC study, we found lots of, um, sorry, the organic contaminant study. We found a number of contaminants, but most of them were actually, you know, at, at levels that were several orders of magnitude below where we'd be worried about them, them being dangerous necessarily. They're there, but you know, again, this PCR technique is also it like the mass spec stuff that we do. It's incredibly sensitive, and so we can find it if it's mm -hmm. there. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's it's at levels that are are necessarily dangerous. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Drew. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Dr. Dwayne DeFries. Gonna give us a federal and state legislative update. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, before I start, I just wanna thank you. Uh, sitting and watching you deliberate on your project list makes me proud. Uh, your due diligence, your attention to detail is exactly you know, what this needs, and I think you're all probably as surprised as I am after five years in the NEP at how complicated this gets. Uh, my staff <coughs> administered 53 contracts last year. They're much smaller, a little less complicated, and we're in the weeds all the time, so thank you very much. When Virginia asked me to give this, I actually tried to convince her not to do it. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you why. I just got back late last night from Tallahassee. Um, you know, we're in a nine-week session. Uh, starting next week, we're in the seventh inning stretch. And whatever happened yesterday, next week could be different. So I'm gonna give you a high level view of where I think we are, starting from the beginning. So when I first started tracking, and I need to have a, a statement on the record, I am not a lobbyist. You know, I am not registered as a lobbyist. When I go up there, I go up as the executive director and senior scientist in the National Asteroid Program, and it's for information purposes. So I try to get information, and when asked, I'll get involved and supply information uh, when I do get asked for that and it happens. So at the beginning of the session and going into those first weeks, over 3,000 bills were filed. When we get at the end of the session, my prediction is less than 10 percent, way less, will actually get heard in committee. I had over 50 bills that I started to track in the beginning that had water or Indian River Lagoon and now we're down to it's not even a handful. It's really just, you know, one significant bills and then a lot of appropriation. And so the one bill that had most traction this past week is the Clean Waterways Act, uh, Senator Debbie Mayfield. It's a comprehensive bill. It addresses, you know, numerous issues from biosolids to, you know, TMDLs and BMAPs. Um, yes, yesterday it was in committee, uh, passed almost unanimously. There was one nay vote because of some detail issues about process. Um, that will head to the Senate floor. And I just want to remind everybody, I, I've been getting phone calls on that bill about when it started stronger and, you know, we're concerned, you know, about some of the amendments that have happened. This is part of the sausage making of legislation. I learned many years ago from a really good lobbyist. He said, Duane, it's really hard to create a bill. It's really easy to kill a bill. And so this bill is moving forward. It, it still has, you know, we've got three weeks left. A lot can happen. But it is a significant, you know, bill that will allow us to move forward in the future uh, with amendments as needed. And so I am, I'm encouraged about where that bill is. You know, it looks like it has support. Uh, I don't think we're going to get into conference next week. Uh, I think it's going to be the following week, which is getting kind of late. And so I'm getting asked a lot about appropriations, and the answer is I don't know yet. So everything that's in the appropriations side, you know, is still pretty active, but I did pull the two budgets, and if you're in the weeds like I am, it's always good to look at the budgets. 
And there's a significant difference between Senate and the House right now. And so when you look at Indian River Lagoon specific issues in the Senate, you know, tens if not maybe hundreds of millions of dollars difference in some of those categories. So I guess the best advice I can say is stay tuned. Uh, we've had champions up and down the Indian River Lagoon, not just Senator Debbie Mayfield, but almost every senator and every House member along the lagoon was either a sponsor of a bill or a co-sponsor. And so because you don't see them on the front end right at the moment doesn't mean they haven't been in the trenches. Representative Randy Fine um, has been the champion of septic to sewer and wastewater improvements. And if you start to look for his bill, you may not see it because it's been moved into other bills. So we will have a clearer picture uh, probably the end of next week or the following week on where we stand. Uh, but there's no question that the governor's leadership, and you see this even in your project list, uh, when the governor said he wanted $625 million, you know, for this year's budget for water, and that includes Everglades, the most important part of that request, which we'll see if it happens, is that he asked for it recurring. So getting this year to year makes it really difficult for you at Sorrel or us at the NEP to plan beyond that next year. And you can see already that some of your first year projects, because of permits, because of you know, legal issues, um, it takes a while. And if we do the start and stop you know, it's almost better to have less money and have it recurring where you can actually budget to it than to try to fight this year to year. So I'm going to continue to, you know, promote the idea that recurring funding is exactly what we need. And, and you guys are the gold standard both in size of program and also the fact that for 10 years we can count on this sales tax. So, you know, kudos to the citizens of Brevard County. Um, anything on the state side, you know, I'll try to keep Virginia, we talk almost weekly about this stuff and uh, you'll start to see the news shifting now to those bills that are still alive. Um, I want to turn your attention though to the federal side and this is exciting stuff and I've left two bills with you, uh, House Bill 4044, Senate Bill 3171. National Estuary Programs are authorized and reauthorized every five years. If you are not reauthorized by Congress, it's doubtful <coughs> that you're ever going to see an appropriation. So reauthorization is a big deal. Our reauthorization is up 20, you know, 2021, 2022. And I'm really pleased to say that we've got two bills, uh, House and Senate, uh, supporting reauthorization, bipartisan support. Um, and so we are moving forward early, and I hope we can get these through before we hit November. Uh, but what's most important, if you look at the numbers on these two bills, both of these bills with bipartisan support are calling for a doubling of the National Estuary Program base funding uh, starting in 2022. Now that is not a lot of money when we compare it to the Sorrel funding. Uh, we are currently getting 600000 a year. That's been flat from the feds uh, for many years, in fact, decades. The good news in December, when President Trump passed the, the budget in December, we got a 10% increase for next year, which is the first increase we've seen in a while. But I will keep you all posted as this moves forward. Reauthorization provides a positioning for appropriation. Every single year we have to fight for appropriation. And so next week we're anticipating a bipartisan letter in the House to start moving the 21 year appropriation forward. Uh, we have been authorized for the last five years uh, to 750,000 a year. Uh, we have never been appropriated at the full authorized amount in the Clean Water Act. Uh, this is the first year that it looks like we have bipartisan support to do that. And while it's not a lot of money, you know, somebody said yesterday, they said, well, Dwayne, it's only, you know, 60,000 on 600. 
you know, we're leveraging these dollars hard, not only with our partners, but also with you at Sorrel. And so, you know, we'll take every dollar we can get because every project that moves forward is progress. So I'm guardedly, you know, optimistic about this. You know, it's as hard as it is in Tallahassee, it's even harder up in Washington, D.C., but we're headed in the right direction, and we will keep you posted as we move forward. Uh, with that, I have a couple other, you know, related issues I just want to bring up. Uh, on your places, you have the brand new. You can smell them. They came out of the printer less than 24 hours ago. So don't leave them in your car. You may be overcome by print fumes. But if you go onto this, we've actually looked back over 30 years. So you can see the cumulative effects of this federal funding, uh, which for a long time was the only driver, the cash driver of a lot of Indian River Lagoon projects. Uh, and so you'll see uh, from 1990 to 2015, 27 million dollars of federal funding came through the pipeline to fund over a thousand projects. And since we, re, you know, created the IRL Council, which is now not just federal funding, but a combination of federal and local funding, you know, we are now committed since 2015 at about 6.3 million, 86 projects in the pipeline, you know, some completed. Uh, we're going to bring another 15 or 18 or so, I forget how many, uh, to next year's budget. So we're moving forward. And so that's the legislative update. And Mr. Chair, if I have a minute, I've just got a couple other things I want to update you on uh, as it relates to some other activities that I think are going to be important to you all. Uh, First Virginia mentioned um, last week's, uh, it was a two-day Indian River Lagoon, Lagoon Symposium. If you go online at Harbor Branch, you can look at the abstracts. Not only was I encouraged, I was pleased to see the quality and the diversity of projects that we saw. And most importantly to me was how many of those science projects were answering questions that directly relate to the kind of questions that we need answered when we're doing management. So this is a pivot that is not subtle, it's really dramatic. Our scientific community is coming to the table uh, to start to answer some of the questions. And I know that you're doing some of that with your projects, uh, but I'm gonna encourage us all, including the citizens who listen to this, you know, we need to continue to push for funding science. You know, driving decisions without good factual and scientific information is a bad idea. And there's a lot of things we don't understand yet in our previous a presenter showed you, you know, just a little bit about what we're learning about muck and some of the things we still need to know to make really good decisions. So that's number one. Uh, number two, um, next week, and I gave uh, staff a copy of my draft. I also served as the co-chair of the Florida Ocean Alliance. Next week is Ocean's Day in the Capitol, and Florida Ocean Alliance is going to formally present an economic update on the ocean and coastal economy of the state of Florida. And here are the, the snapshots on the numbers. Coastal counties contributed $797 billion to Florida's economy in 2018. 2018, there were more than a million jobs directly and indirectly created by activities that used ocean and coastal resources. And the ocean economy contributed $73.9 billion to the state's economy from direct and indirect. Those are big numbers. I was up this week actually on a whole different set of responsibilities. I served the governor on the Career Source Florida board, you know, looking at workforce issues in the state. Uh, we need to continue to really remind everybody that when you do these projects, that are infrastructure projects within our community, whether it's natural infrastructure like oyster restoration or the biggest baffle box east of the Mississippi. John Windsor and I were saying that's going to be the new tourist attraction for Brevard. <laughs> There's no parking over there, no. no. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> But, you know, we're really talking about jobs. We're talking about economic drivers that impact almost every subsector of our economy. And if we're going to attract a 21st century workforce, 
Um, high quality of life is part of that. And it's going to impact every sector, including real estate and construction and transportation. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we are also working on a statewide plan. Uh, draft is expected sometime in May. We're hoping that will be the beginning of a kind of a connecting the dots between environment, ecosystem, and economy. And then lastly, uh, a little bit of bad news, I think. Um, we had a state resiliency officer just six months ago, uh, chosen by our governor. And uh, this week we heard that uh, she has been cherry picked by the President of the United States to go to Washington, D.C. So Dr. Julia Neshwet is going to be leaving the state of Florida. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping they get a replacement soon because that, she was extremely good. She had a vision. You know, I had, I was with her just a week and a half, two weeks ago, uh, talking about coastal resiliency and emergency preparation and planning. And so, uh, you know, I'm sad to see that, you know, vacancy open because we're moving forward on those issues. And what you do is actually building resiliency. At some point, we'll bring Randy Parkinson in uh, with our, uh, our climate change plan, which is almost in its final f stage. But it's, it's remarkable. If we're going to have clean water, man, it's all about the plumbing. When you get right down to it, this is an infrastructure issue. And then um, I will keep you all informed, but we have been bringing uh, expert scientists into each of our science, technology, engineering, and modeling advisory committees. I think John has been in a number of these. You know, two meetings ago it was mercury. You know, the last meeting was ocean acidification. Just want to give you a heads up that our May meeting, uh, we're trying to get uh, some algal bloom experts, especially on brown tide, uh, to move to come over to us to talk about that cutting edge of science, of algal blooms, other than red tide and some of the other critters. Uh, the Red Tide Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force has just released its consensus, first consensus document uh, that is on the street. If you want that, Virginia, I can get you copies. I serve on that committee. And we are aligning very closely uh, with the Blue-Green Algal Task Force, looking at freshwater cyanobacterial blooms. And we are working, well actually I am working to make sure that the HAB task force, as we migrate away from the red tide story, you know, and, that, and we'll be at that for a while, but we also take into some of the considerations, the challenges we have here uh, with brown tide. And you noticed in our previous uh, presentation, Karenia brevis in Sykes Creek, that is the ocean red tide organism, you know, which suggests both things that we don't know and vulnerabilities we might have, you know, as we manage the fresh water loads uh, into the system. So with that, I'll just open for questions. And again, thank you for all your due diligence and, and hard work. Questions for Dwayne? You guys are easy. Doesn't appear to be. Have now. a great week. Thank you, Dwayne. Virginia, Virginia, you thank, got a comment. Thank you very much, Dwayne. I did um, just print out the first page of, I got this uh, in the wee hours of the night, um, the status of our legislative funding requests um, for the county. And so we, we still have um, multiple funding requests in play, and we'll, we'll see what happens with those over the next three weeks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next up we've got uh, the story map edition from Matt. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we're gonna talk uh, briefly today about reclaimed water. Uh, what is it, where is it in the county, and what could we or should we, should we do about it? So reclaimed water, just to refresh you, it's water that comes from the community to the wastewater treatment plants uh, it's treated with a few levels of treatment to remove solids, to remove uh, pathogens, and then to remove s most of the nitrogen and phosphorus, but not all of it. That water is then sent back out to the community through transmission lines, through a network of them, uh, that go to properties and uh, places like golf courses or fountains uh, to use it as irrigation only, uh, not for drinking. Although some places like uh, San Diego and other places in California, like real arid, 
they're starting to use technology where they actually turn it all the way back into potable water. Um, so the problem with reclaimed water is that it still has nutrients in it, and the nutrients, the plants love it, it's fertilizer water, but different areas in the county have different levels of nitrogen phosphorus in their reclaimed water because the water coming out of the plants is different because the plants are different. Uh, the plants employ different technologies. The, some of them are older. Uh, some of them have more people using it. And then depending on the time of year with transient populations or maybe, maybe air temperature, the, the nutrient levels fluctuate. So what does this mean for the homeowners using this water? Those homeowners using reclaimed water on their lawns or irrigation, depending on the nutrient levels in that water, they may not need to fertilize. And if they are fertilizing, they may be over fertilizing. So their lawns are getting enough nitrogen and phosphorus with just the reclaimed water. And they're adding some on top of that. That's, we know that's not a lagoon loyal practice and that could be a problem. So let's take a look at this uh, story map page we created. So this map shows all the areas using reclaimed water in the county, um, most of them. Um, and the colors denote the nitrogen, the approximate annual average nitrogen coming out of those plants to be used as reclaimed. So for example, Vieira, uh, this treatment plant is in the red. That's where the treatment plant is. And then we'll look at this here. The nitrogen coming out of there is 5.4 milligrams per liter. Um, with that much nitrogen in the water, the citizens would only need about 1.2 pounds extra nitrogen on their lawns per year. IFS recommends two pounds per year, so they're getting 0.8 pounds of nitrogen in their reclaimed water. Uh, so Cocoa Beach here, for example, 2.98 milligrams per liter, pretty low. Uh, you may need to add a little bit of nitrogen. Uh, somewhere like um, Palm Bay, which is slated for an upgrade of the Save Our Lagoon plan. These, they're getting 16.5 milligrams per liter nitrogen per year. So they're actually adding 0.7 pounds more nitrogen than they need. So if, if they're adding fertilizer, they're over fertilizing. So uh, in constructing this map, I spoke with some of the plant operators, and they were, some of them were all for possibly metering the reclaimed lines, which we've talked about before. Some of them said, no, 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 we want to get rid of this water. We, we don't have enough of it. People, uh, they use it like crazy. Uh, we, we don't want to restrict them. We want them to just use all they can. Um, that, for example, like um, Cocoa Beach, uh, they actually share water with Cape Canaveral, their lines intersect. They, in the dry season, they use up all their water. They actually have a storage tank for reclaimed water. I think it's five million gallons where they actually have to use that to irrigate the rest of it because the demand's so high. So they maybe didn't want to meter. Uh, somewhere like uh, Vieira, uh, the plant operator says, you know, people use up all their water. If we restrict them through uh, metering and charge them for it, we have one, we have a a new set of revenue that we could use for maybe plant upgrades or, or other projects. And, and uh, they're also not using as much. Um, so that uh, keeps the amount of nitrogen uh, from getting out into the, the storm water and to the lagoon. So yeah, so there's some areas you can see in red that uh, you know, people definitely don't need to, may not need any extra fertilizer depending on their soil type and, and whatnot. Uh, and then there's some areas where it's, you know, caution, hey, you may not need fertilizer, or you may not need as much as you think. And then uh, there's also these, all, these areas also are sp hot spots where we need to work on uh, the wastewater. And uh, Ed, as you'll see in the plan, as you saw, they, we are. Uh, yeah, so uh, any questions? Questions? Um, I would like to know the cocoa. Cocoa? Yeah. Because it's all in red. And when we had seen a chart earlier 
I had noted that they were on the lower end, so it surprises me to see them. Right, so the, the plan is based on data that was available in 2016. Matt contacted the state and went through all of the 2019 data, mm. and so the, the, the story map is based on more recent information. Ah. Uh, the, and these are annual averages, so some months they may be really low, and then uh, a month, one month, you know, maybe in the winter where you have a lot of uh, the transient population here, that that number may spike. Or if we have a, a storm and they need to uh, get the water pumped through the treatment plant quicker, maybe the the values would go up too. Dennis, it, where was it, Coco? You showed Rockledge. Oh, Coco. Oh, okay. Um, just to remember when all this started. Uh, originally, most of this wastewater was going into the Indian River Direct, right? Correct. That's where it was going. So the reclaimed water was being diverted to put on lawns to hopefully turn into biomass of some sort and stay on the property. It, is there, there is a negative, I can tell, from if you over fertilize. Um, we don't want them to go back the other direction in any way, I assume. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. The other choices for disposing, sorry, the other choices for disposing of, of this reclaimed water is, at the time they were talking about deep well injection and things like that, which everybody screams and yells about too. So there's, it's just a large problem. Is that, do I hit that correctly? Yeah, so the other option is that uh, they do things to um, trap more of the phosphorus in the biosolids. Okay. Right. If it's not in the water, it's right. it's in the biosolids for for phosphorus. Which for nitrogen, expense. you can actually uh, aerate a lot of it off into the atmosphere. Of course, then we have atmospheric deposition right. that comes back right. down. But yes, it's conservation of mass. It's going right. to go somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With well, one of the operators at the Viera, the uh, our South Central Regional Facility, he he mentioned you know, it's. He's got, he sees people with this uh, spraying it into the gutter on the lawn because it's, they pay a certain fee per month. They can use as much as they want uh, with, with restrictions, of course. But um, volume-wise, they can use as much as they want. If they're metered, hey, maybe they'll direct their sprinklers on their lawns and, and kind of you know, control, it, control it a little better. The, 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 excuse me. The users of, of uh, reclaimed water are not under the same watering restrictions as the rest of us? They are. are not. They are. They are, yeah. okay. So that's this time of year is what, once a week? Once a week. <coughs> However, we know that they are, that, that in some places they, they don't follow those guidelines. They just I'm don't. shocked. Shocked. <laughs> Lorraine, did you have another question? Yeah, and well, just a reaction to that, I'd say that <clears throat> so many people are unaware, that's what I've found, of what the restrictions even are. So somehow we need to do a better job on that. In regard to the reuse, um, so the most significant, we talk about excess nutrients would be, again, would be those homes that are closest to the water, to the lagoon, um, versus those that are further away. So some sort of concentrated education effort there might be helpful. Yeah, making it aware of you know what it is, what's in it, and how you may or may not need to supplement it. Penny, mm -hmm. I've, I've just always felt that this is a, a kind of almost like a, a hidden danger because we we do encourage it's cheap, um, and we do encourage people to use it without without the education of knowing what they're doing. I I just think it would be interesting to see what what how much nitrogen um, is saved by using in Cocoa Beach compared to the rest of the, the county, just because I know Cocoa Beach has the highest level of filtration, right? Matt, is that right? Pretty high, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if you looked at Cocoa Beach as, 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 as what they're doing and then combine all the others together and see how much nitrogen and phosphorus a year. And, and the, the reason for that would just be to encourage the others to get to that level um, and, and encourage, appropriate, I don't know what, you know, what, what we could do to help, help that along, but I just think it'd be interesting to see how much how much additional nitrogen um, is being added in phosphorus when we have somebody who's, who, who's, who, who we could model the others off of? Okay, anybody else? Yeah. I was just going to suggest to you, like, 
with Cocoa Beach after they get done with their recent project that they're doing, if we could do a tour, you know, and kind of help publicize that um, project and all of their successes with that, because that is a good point. I think if, you know, we highlight their work more, <laughs> then that might be an encouragement to the other utilities to, to do the same. I, I agree with that. So, but it, but I'm very interested to see like what exactly it is, you know, and, and kind of maybe do, you know, a little video of it and get that word out. Okay, anybody else? Uh, one comment on the reuse water, maybe future thinking, uh, but it hasn't been future thinking for a long time. Uh, this week in the legislature, I was hearing a discussion of uh, setting e um, DEP off to develop regulations for reuse water to be used for c human consumption. And so think about this now. It, 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 we've gone a couple of rounds with this over the last 50 years in trying to think about recycling water. Uh, we keep thinking about the nitrogen phosphorus here, but the water is the best resource there. And we need to use that water again. Um, and so reuse water, going back to you know recycling it completely is, is, is the way to go. Uh, thank you, Matt. Good job. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go off into other uh, new business here in just a second, but once again, anybody from the public who wants to make comments, please uh, fill out a comment card. And then it just struck me that uh, uh, the suggestion I made earlier that we have an agenda item for Vinny's topics on discuss old projects and, per and, and purchasing materials now. Um, I can't talk to Vinny after the meeting because it's a sunshine violation. And so I wonder, Vinny, would you mind talking with Virginia and developing the agenda item that you would feel comfortable with? And then we can all talk about it next month. Is that all right? Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> new business. Election of new <coughs> chair and vice chair. Does somebody want to take that over or am I supposed to lead that? Well, I thought we were going to have the vice chair roll into the chair. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't voted on last year. Well, I would like to make a motion that the vice chair become the chair. Second. Second. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm nice. I know. I know. Hold, d discussion. Any discussion on that? I wanted to, to put something into the election bylaws about no men with white hair are permitted to serve as chair of the committee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think there might be an objection right there. It is discriminatory, yeah. <laughs> I, and, you, and, and those of you who know me know I've been pushing for more than 20 years to get more young people involved in these processes. And you generally find meetings, if you look around the audience here, there are not many young people here. They're probably out working or in school someplace. But I, I really would like to have more young people involved. Um, any other nominations? Do I, so we have a vote now? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> motion, uh, motion. I'm sorry, you were supposed to take public comment before oh. the vote. Ah. Oh, and that public comment on the, on, anybody want to say anything in the public? <laughs> not on this, not on this. Not item. on this Never issue. mind, not on this yeah. item, okay. sorry. I didn't realize that, thank you. All right, um, did we vote already? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now we need a vice chair. Who's going to nominate a vice chair? Now everybody looks down at the table, right? I I I make a motion to nominate Courtney Barker to be the vice chair. Is Courtney Barker willing to be the vice chair? Recognizing that, that Vinny's established a new rule now, the Vinny rule that the vice chair automatically right. becomes chair next time, yeah. and so I you know. I think Lorraine should be the vice chair. Uh, well, having served as the chair, I'd like to see someone that has not been in that okay. position. I'll, I'll be glad to do it. Okay. Anybody else? Has she accepted? She said she says she's willing to do it. Yeah. I'll uh, second the motion then. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 We need public comment on that one too. No public comment. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Vice. Okay, general public comments. I've got one card from Lou Kotnick. And I think probably we need to have a permanent card for Lou. Uh, <laughs> so to, to save him from having, maybe we yeah, just, give recycle. Him the, just give him the card back and turn it in next month. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. 
uh, and congratulations on your uh, election. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, Lou Kotnick and I'm here representing the uh, Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition, which is a coalition of uh, 25 uh, different organizations, uh, thousands of, um, of followers and subscribers. A and you know that we're dedicated to the restoration um, of, of the lagoon and through education and building support uh, for the SORL program uh, within the community. And as a part of that, we've created a, a video um, which really is used, uh, we're using to convey the progress uh, being made by all of our excellent, all of your excellent work. And so with that, I wanted to share that uh, with you here now uh, and, and offer it for your use. restoring seagrasses, and improving habitat for fish and wildlife. Dolphins and manatees are coming back. Baffle boxes are being installed to trap stormwater runoff, collecting waste and debris before it runs into the lagoon. Septic tanks near the lagoon are being switched to sewer lines, eliminating nitrates and phosphates that would otherwise pollute the lagoon. Mangroves are being planted to restore the natural shoreline. Even oysters are helping the lagoon. Recycled shells become home to new oysters. And each oyster can filter 30 to 50 gallons of polluted lagoon water a day. This is not going to fix the lagoon all by itself, but we're hoping it'll be one of the tools in the toolbox to bring our lagoon back to a healthy ecosystem. All of this work is funded by the half-cent sales tax Brevard voters approved in 2016 to clean up the lagoon. Each project is progress in our battle to save the Indian River Lagoon. Well, and the credit, thank you very much. Uh, the credit goes to a lot of people that were noticed there, inclu including the county. Um, but also, I want to single out two people in particular, um, Philip Harris uh, and uh, Fred Mays. Uh, both are active, actively working with uh, uh, the coalition. So thank you very much. Let's keep it going. Thank you. Anybody else in the public? Oh. Pardon? I just wanted to let you all know, the coalition know, you guys do a great job in that straight talk event. And the one that you held in Satellite Beach, I have gotten so many people that have come up to me and said, I really enjoyed that event. You know, thank you so much for having that. So, you know, I just want to, you know, hats off to you all for everything you do, because that, that was, it's incredible to see how well attended they are. And I, I mean, I can hold a meeting and 30 people show up. You guys do it, and that was, you know, 200. So I think, you know, you guys do a really good job, and I just want to say thank you. Okay. Were those your final yes, comments? That was. That's the Great. So that comments. leads. Anybody else have final comments for the meeting? I'm curious who else is attending the MRC Awards dinner from the board Saturday? Okay. I'm going to thank the MRC for nominating us. I, I won't be able to make it, but um, thank you for that. And, and, and for all your education that you guys do, I think you, you put so much education out into the public, and that is such an important um, such an important part of what we do. And I was just looking at the numbers, and if you look at the numbers we spend on education compared to the numbers we spend on everything else, I mean, it's just dwarfed. So uh, thank you and all the other partners that are uh, continuing to push that education piece. Any other final comments? Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to blow our horn. Um, 
The Brevard Nature Alliance, who sponsors the Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival, made the Indian River Lagoon Coalition the recipient of our Giving Back to Nature funds this year. So we, we're going to give them five or $6,000 specifically earmarked to continue the straight talk um, sessions. Great. Any other final comments? If not, do I need a motion to adjourn or can I just declare we're over? We're, we're done. <laughs>the opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the board of county commissioners of brevard county florida space coast government television or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter the board of county commissioners of brevard county florida space coast government television and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period